bringing you the latest in tax credit news, insight, and analysis. This is Tax Credit Tuesday with your host, Michael Novogratik. Hello, I'm Michael Novogratik, and this is Tax Credit Tuesday. This is October 15th, 2024 podcast. We have another excellent podcast for you today. Last week, we focused on the New Markets Tax Credits Awards announcement. This week, we're going to stay focused on community development and discuss another critical economic development tax incentive. As our audience on YouTube can see, I'm here with my partner, Jason Watkins, which may serve as a big clue as to which tax incentive we're going to discuss today. Jason is back on Tax Red Tuesday to discuss hot topics in Opportunity Zones investing. Now, for me and many others, the hottest topic, as many will say, is the looming deferral deadline on capital gains. We will talk more about that in a moment. But before we dive into today's episode, I do want to take a moment to recognize that this Thursday, October 17th, marks the 35th anniversary of Novogratik as a company. Those of you watching on YouTube, may have noticed a 35th anniversary background in a few recent episodes of Tax Credit Tuesday, as well as the backgrounds that both Jason and I are using today. Those of you who are listening to the podcast, you'll have to take my word for it. Now, on behalf of the partners and me, let me say thank you to all of our Novogata clients and all of our current and past colleagues throughout the last three and a half decades. We're looking forward to continuing to work with all of you for many years to come to expand and improve this nation's affordable housing stock, to restore its historic buildings, to create and provide green and clean energy, and to improve economic opportunities and wellness in distressed communities. Now we'll turn back to our topic of the week. Now, as I said earlier, Many using the Opportunity Zones tax incentive to raise capital to invest in distressed communities will tell you that there is a singular issue that is top of mind. And that is the looming December 31, 2026 deadline. Capital gains recognized after December 31, 2026 cannot be deferred by investing in an opportunity fund. This means absent renewal of the incentive, opportunity zones would in essence expire as regards new investment. In preparing for this podcast, Jason and I crunched the numbers, Jason more than me, and found that more than half of the value of the various tax incentives originally available to opportunity zones investors is the ability to exclude gain from investments held for at least 10 years. And that is the one aspect of the various tax incentives that remains available for capital gains recognized on or before December 31, 2026. So I said 50% of the value of the original tax incentives available for opportunities investors is attributable to this 10-year deferral. The value of the 10-year deferral actually rises from roughly 50% to two-thirds when dealing with depreciable real estate investments. Now, I'm sure some of you probably heard me say December 31, 2026, and you think, well, 2026 is pretty far away. That's two years. That's a long time. But I would urge our audience to think about the fact that it's really not. Uh, two years will be here before we know it. Uh, and in order to address that, many in the Opportunity Zones Incentive community are working to convince Congress to extend and renew the incentive next year. Now that would come as part of what's being referred to, by at least the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Jason Smith, the Super Bowl of Tax. And next year is considered the Super Bowl of Tax because a cluster of tax provisions that were included in the 2017 Tax Cut Jobs Act, or the bill formerly known as the Tax Cut Jobs Act, are set to expire. Now, Jason and I will discuss the short-term and long-term effects of this looming deadline for investors. Jason and I will also discuss how investors are meeting the challenges around it, 
both in the legislative push for an extension of renewal, as well as the practical on the ground mechanics of using opportunity zones as an investment strategy and as a community development strategy. We will wrap up the session by talking about ways that you, our listener, members of our audience, can get engaged and take action around pushing for extension and renewal. Now, one way you can get engaged is just around the corner, and that's at our upcoming Opportunity Zone Summit on November 6th in Washington, D.C. That's Wednesday, November 6th in Washington, D.C. And yes, that is the day after the election. Jason is the chair of the summit, and he will be leading one of the panel discussions that day. I will also be there, and I'll be leading a Washington report session. Since it is the day after the elections, this means there's going to be considerable breaking news to discuss. A lot of what you hear in the podcast here today will have a lot more definition and definement, refinement on that day. I also note that there might even be some news which is still breaking on that Wednesday. So I do encourage you to join us. If you're interested in joining us, please go to the Novogratic website at novoco.com. That's novoco, N-O-V-O-C-O dot com. After you watch or listen to this episode, and by going to novoco.com, you can register for this. And we would love to see you there. Now, we're really looking forward to the summit, but in the meantime, let's turn to today's podcast. We have a lot to discuss. So if you're ready, let's get started. Jason, welcome back to Task Red Tuesday. Hey, thanks, Mike. Always my pleasure to be here. Well, it's always great to have you on the podcast, and I appreciate your patience as I walk through my somewhat lengthy introduction. Now, to our audience, Jason was last on the podcast in August, and that podcast was a continuation of the discussion from a Senate Finance Committee hearing where I spoke in July, July 30th to be exact. And I discussed several community development tax incentives, including opportunity zones, new markets tax credits, historic tax credits, as well as private activity bond finance, affordable rental housing through the law of housing tax credit incentive. So Jason, before we jump into this week's conversation, please share with our audience some of the services you provide to clients here at NUPGRAD. Sure. So again, Jason Watkins, I'm a partner in our firm's Atlanta office. And I provide audit, tax, compliance, and consulting services. Quite a bit of that around opportunity zones. Um, I also lead the Novogratic Opportunity Zones Working Group. Uh, the Working Group, and Mike mentioned that earlier, that's a group of qualified opportunity funds and developers, investors, law firms, other community development professionals. We all work together to brainstorm solutions to technical opportunity zone issues as well as provide recommendations to Congress and Treasury uh, for solutions on how to make DOZ incentive as efficient as possible. Great. Thank you for that. And thanks for all you do for Novogratz clients and, and all that you did helping stand up the incentive after it was enacted back in 2017. So let's start by taking the conversation and talk about the looming deadline of December 31, 2026. And I wanted to ask you, not I wanted to ask you, I will ask you, to level set for our audience what the implications of that deadline is. It's easy to say it's a December 31, 2026 deadline. And after that, you can't invest capital gains realized after that date uh, in opportunity funds to defer. But what does that mean as a practical matter for an investor? Yeah, and I think it helps to put some some dates on that. So there's different ways that an investor can can realize a gain. They can recognize or realize it directly through a sale, a sale stock. There's a deadline investors have to invest uh, a gain in order to qualify for a defer to invest a gain in the qualified opportunity fund. That deadline is 180 days. So for an investor that directly realizes a capital gain, 180 days from the day that they say sold the stock. However, if the investor, well, let me back up. So let's say an investor sold a stock on December 31st, 2026. On that date, they would have 180 days to recognize the gain. So that puts it out into June of 2027, but they can then still invest into a qualified opportunity fund 
and be eligible for OZI uh, benefits. If the gain is instead realized a pass-through entity, such as a partnership, so this would be a gain that an investor would get on a K-1, for instance, the investor can elect to set March 15th as the start of the 180-day period, then March 15th, 2027 would be the start. That March 15th date is that that's the due date of the partnership tax return without extensions. And so an investor that elects that to be the start of their 180-day period would have until actually September 11th of 2027 to invest the amount of the gain into a qualified opportunity fund and still be eligible for that long-term 10-year hold benefit. So something to note is that while the OZ incentive does and if you will, for new investment with gains that are realized through December 31st of 2026, that doesn't mean the, the incentive goes away entirely because investors can actually hold their gain um, or hold their investment until as late as December 31st, 2047, before they are actually required to uh, make an election to or, or sell the investment to be eligible for a exclusion of capital gains um, that are realized between the date when they first invested and, and that date. So the, the the incentive goes on for another 21 years beyond 2026. And I think it's important for folks to understand that. So we, you hear a lot about the 10-year hold and having to hold your investment for 10 years, but it's not exactly 10 years. It can be up to 30 years before you really have to make a decision and dispose of the investment to be able to achieve that tax-free exit. As far as what's going on, a potential extension or a renewal, we have seen some legislation that's been introduced over the last couple of Congresses. The Opportunity Zones Transparency Extension and um, Improvement Act was introduced in both the House and the Senate in the previous Congress. And in the current Congress, it's only been introduced in the House. Uh, this is the bill, and we've talked about it on here too. Yes, so this have. is the bill that would reinstate the reporting requirements that were a part of the original legislation that had to be cut out because of, of various Senate rules of how, how the bill was passed as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Also extend the deferral period from 2026 to the end of 2028, which would be nice. It would replace certain higher income census tracts, would allow for fund and fund investing, and then it would also create a state and community dynamism fund. And then a second piece of legislation that was introduced in the current Congress is uh, the Rural OZ Incentive. And it's been introduced a couple of times, actually, in the House. And this would create sort of a new OZ Incentive that would be specific to census tracts that are located in rural counties that have experienced persistent poverty. All signs are sort of pointing towards some significant tax legislation in 2025. But a lot of that's going to be wrapped in and how the election results. So let's talk about the election results briefly. I've as you, given lots of uh, sort of presentations. We have our new markets conference later this month, and I'll be discussing that as well. And when I think about the election results, I, whenever I make a prediction, I say either there's going to be a democratic sweep or there's going to be a Republican sweep or there's going to be divided government. So I feel confident in that prediction. And when I say democratic sweep, I mean, Harris wins the presidency and the Democrats control the house and the Senate. When I say Republican sweep, I mean, Republicans control the Senate, Republicans control the presidency and the house and divided government means there's some mixture of that where neither party has sole control. So maybe you could share for our audience your perspective as to what each of those three possible outcomes means with respect to opportunity zones or might mean with respect to opportunity zones. And it's, it's important to also recognize that something is going to have to happen legislatively from, from a tax perspective, because the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, most of those provisions expire at the end of 2025, and no one wants to be in Congress when there's a massive tax hike on the American public. So. We really do expect there to be some type of probably major tax legislation in the first part of the next Congress. So yeah, talking about the splits that you had and, and how those might 
might impact the opportunity zone incentives. So a Republican sweep of, of the presidency and, and both uh, both houses of Congress would likely be, be the most beneficial environment for a, an extension or renewal of the, of the OZ incentive. We know that the, the OZ incentive was, was very bipartisan at the outset. And while it still maintains a fair amount of bipartisanship, I think Republicans have taken more ownership of the incentive since then. And I think they'll they'll be more encouraged not only to extend instead of but probably all provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. On the Democrat side, while I noted that the Republicans have taken more ownership, there's still a lot of of interest, I think, in, in the OZ incentive. So it certainly not isn't done. If if the Democrats were to sweep. There's a massive amounts of investment under the OZ incentive, over a hundred billion dollars. And that's gotten everyone's attention. That's a lot of money to move. So the, the legislation was originally bipartisan. It still has a lot of democratic support. Something else to keep in mind is that probably a majority, a lot, very large percentage of the investment is going into Democrat districts. We know that 90 plus percent of the investment dollars have been, have happened in urban areas. Urban areas tend to lean Democrats. So despite maybe some of the public views that have been expressed, the investment's happening quite a bit in Democrat districts. So I think there's going to be an incentive to keep that, that inv those investment dollars flowing into those areas. But maybe under a Democrat lens that the OZ incentive might just take a different form and it might align more with sort of stated Democrat goals, uh, which would probably be more oversight, et cetera. But that being said, probably both a Republican and a Democrat sweep are, are unlikely. And the most likely outcome is probably a slip government. The thinking now is that the Senate would probably flip from Democrat to Republican, probably the strongest outcome of any of any potential guess you can make on this election. And then in the House, there's pretty strong feeling that it might also flip from Republican to Democrat control. So looking at the House first and how that flip in would, would impact opportunity zone. So one question will be, well, who, who's going to take up the baton on the House Democrat side? Dan Kildee has sort of been the most public proponent um, on the House Ways and Means Committee of the opportunities on the Senate. So we, we've looked at well, who has who has co-sponsored legislation in the past, who has publicly expressed some support and opportunities on the Senate. And there, there's a number of potential players here on the Democrat side. Uh, first and foremost is probably Terry Sewell uh, from Alabama. Uh, she co-sponsored OZIA, the OZ Transparency Extension Improvement Act. Um, she's been very supportive of the OZ incentive. Um, but she has other priorities. Uh, she she also works a lot with private activity bonds, new markets, tax credits. There's only so much that someone can take a leadership percentage on or position on. Another option is is Richard Neal. He co-sponsored the original legislation, the Investing in Opportunities Act. He's currently the ranking member, so if control does flip, he would likely become the chair. So it's unlikely he could co-sponsor legislation. Other possibilities include Brad Schneider from Illinois, John Larson from Connecticut, Susan Del Benny from Washington, have all, all co-sponsored the original legislation. And then some of more of a recent development, if you recall the House Ways and Means um, meeting that they had at Erie to discuss Opportunity Zones, uh, Gwen Moore uh, from Wisconsin, a Democrat, was the lone Democrat representative. Uh, but she even noted that she had seen within her own district some of the positive results of the opportunities on the incentive, but she did express a need for additional reporting requirements, which I think is pretty much across both aisles at this point. Yes. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the current state of the house. And then in the Senate and keeping in mind also that any tax legislation is constitutionally required to originate in the house. So if the house does flip to Democrat, then they would, that's probably where the control of the type of uh, legislation, tax legislation would be introduced. So over on the Senate side, so Mike Crapo, currently the ranking member, would likely be the chair. 
And Senator Crapo is very publicly supported Opportunity Zone. So I think that's a, that would be a, a bit of a departure from the current leadership of the Senate Finance Committee with Senator Wyden, who is not so publicly expressed support. <laughs> yes. The ranking member Crapo spoke quite positively of Opportunity Zones at the hearing that I testified at in July, and as you noted, Chairman Wyden of the Senate Finance Committee didn't speak so positively about opportunities. Right. Not, uh, not a secret there. We can't forget that Tim Scott sits on the Senate Finance Committee, and so that's, there's no bigger proponent of opportunity zones than Tim Scott, except for maybe Cory Booker, at least would be equal, and we think that there's a decent chance, based on his seniority now, and that he does not currently sit on one of the sort of prime committees in the Senate, that there's a decent chance that Cory Booker could be added to the Democrat side on the Senate Finance Committee. Multiple reasons for that. A former Senator Bob Menendez is out. He was from New Jersey also, where Cory Booker's from, so it would be sort of replacing state to state. And there's not currently a Democrat senator from the New York tri-state area at all that sits on the Senate Finance Committee. So Cord Booker could be a very logical addition and having both him and Tim Scott sitting on the Senate Finance Committee that's being chaired, excuse me, by Mike Crabo, uh, would be a very positive development on the Senate side, even if they are, well, and, and in this case, they would be sitting in the majority. So that would be a very positive result, we think. Well, thank you for that overview. That's pretty uh, detailed sort of overview. And one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to the Washington re report at the OC summit, the day after the election, is I feel like of these different options, they'll be at least narrowing. <laughs> they may not have fully narrowed uh, by that date, but there'll be lots of sort of interaction and ability to start to say, okay, what are the possibilities and what are the next steps? I would note that from a reporting requirements perspective, when you think of the three scenarios, I think everyone universally is bicameral, bipartisan support for having reporting requirements. But if it does go down, a, a, if there is a Republican sweep or a Democratic sweep, then likely a tax bill is going to be very partisan based and it's going to use the same a Senate approach that was used for the Tax Cut Jobs Act, which basically means reporting couldn't get in again unless, unless there's agreement for Republicans to allow it. Uh, so, so I'm definitely hopeful that next year in the Super Bowl attacks that there is reporting that gets into opportunity zones. I also appreciated your pointing out that over a hundred billion dollars has been invested in opportunity zones since its enactment in 2017, and it is such a big capital flow that it's pretty hard for me to imagine that members of Congress on a provision that has a relatively low tax cost as a function of $100 billion would look at that flow and say, we need to keep that flow going. We might want to modify the requirements uh, to direct it more. So we may want to change the course of this river of of uh, capital going into low income communities, we definitely want to keep it flowing. Then I also thought it might be useful for the audience. You and I are talking about extension and renewal, not extension or renewal. And I just wanted to unpack that for audiences, maybe not be quite clear as to why we're using the, that phraseology. And it's also something that was part of my uh, testimony to the Senate Finance Committee uh, in July. And, and generally, there's this. Uh, goal within many in the opportunity zones community to A, enact reporting, but B, extend the existing deadline a couple of years, and then also renew the opportunity zones incentive, which involve redesignating the various communities using more recent census data and giving governors opportunity to reselect the er elder areas that they want to be uh, opportunity zones. So it's extend the 1231 2026 deadline in a couple of years, and then also renew the designations or redesignate the various uh, areas. So with that, uh, I thought we would focus a little bit more on the uh, 
practicality of this December 31, 2026 deadline. And if there was uh, any more view or anything else you wanted to share about the urgency of an extension versus waiting for an extension. We, we really can't wait to the last minute for an extension. Or, and I know in some cases there have been retroactive extensions that have been done for other, other provisions in the tax code, like bonus depreciation. We can't do that because these projects take time to develop. It takes time to get them entitled. And so we need an extension as soon as possible so that capital can continue to flow. We don't want to have any interruption of investment or development because of this uncertainty. And then there's, I mean, there's timing rules for investors to take into, my, into account too. I mean, it's a pretty short period, like we talked about earlier, that an investor has from the day the game is realized until they have to have that investment into a fund. And if there is uncertainty about whether the incentive is going to continue or about whether a project can be completed in a timely manner, they may not have confidence to even take up the investment to begin with. So that's what we want to avoid. We don't want some of these investments, some of these projects take more than 26 months to do. We have 26 months right now until the end of the incentive is for, for, for new gains. So we want more time for investors to be able to not have to worry about this impending deadline and have that impact whether they make an investment or not. And I also think about it from the broader perspective that tax provisions don't get enacted isolated basis. They're part of larger bills. And there's going to be a massive tax bill next year because of the expiration of the Trump era tax cuts. So there'll either be a bill done on a partisan or a bipartisan basis, and it may not get done by the end of next year, maybe early 2026, but certainly I, f I feel like something will be done by the middle of 2026 at the latest. And when that package, when that tax bill does make it across the finish line, if opportunity zones, incentives, extension, uh, and renewal isn't in it. Then the question becomes, well, when is that next tax bill going to be? And rest assured, after Congress finds their way through addressing the efforts of these tax cuts, they're not going to, the next thing they're going to immediately be thinking about isn't another tax bill. So there may not be another vehicle uh, after this next tax bill. Plus, you're saying mid 2026, there will be an election a few months after that. Correct. Exactly. Uh, so with respect to this discussion, uh, maybe you could share more on the ground in terms of what you're hearing from people working with Opportunity Zones in terms of how they're addressing the practical aspects of this deadline extension today. Right. And, and we're hearing that, that fundraising is becoming more difficult. A large part of that is because if you look back to the early days of the incentive, go back to 2019, say, or 2020, at that point, a fund could say to investors, well, you get to defer a gain or you don't have to pay taxes on it for six, seven years. That's a very attractive incentive, even though, as you and I have discussed, it may not have as much value as, or it doesn't have as much value as the long-term hold. But because that, that deferral period is short, and now we're down to just well, you have to pay your, your taxes in two years now, the incentive, the perceived value of the incentive may not be as much. And so fundraisers were having trouble with fundraising because investors uh, don't see that immediate long-term benefit. When yeah, I kind of look at that and think that if you go to someone and say, you know, you can defer your, the tax on your gain, they you defer recognizing the gain as a consequence, the tax on the gain for four, five, six years, that seems in, in the moment, <laughs> creates a lot of uh, a value, if you will. Whereas as you, as we kind of pointed out, the 10 year hold and that basis step up is really where more than half the value is and maybe even more depending on the type of investments. But that definitely takes a, a more informed investor. And as you point out, as uh, from a fundraising perspective, it basically means more work for those raising capital to go through that explanation. Yeah, that's, I, have, I have a lot of these conversations because I have a lot of fun clients and they'll reach out and say, do you have any ideas? Yeah. What can we do for fundraising? 
and education is a big part of it. It's getting the word out there. The value is in the long-term hold, and you have to get away from selling it. And, and, and thinking about this, it's just a deferral. The, the, the value is in the long-term hold. But the other thing I'm hearing from investors is that, of course, most recently, we've had interest rate cuts. Uh, that is creating a better macroeconomic environment for real estate development. And so we're expecting to see an uptick in development over the next over the short term, which is going to lead uh, to there being a greater need for fundraising. So the one probably follows the other in this case. And I don't think that just OZ investment's been down. I think all investment has been down over the last couple of years. OZ's probably done better than it should have because of the additional benefits here available to the right. investor. So what do you say to an investor out there that might say, Jason, I... I love the fact that I can invest in opportunity zones and my capital will be helping distressed communities through equity investments in businesses. But if I defer my capital gain, isn't there a risk that my, the capital gains tax rate could go up such that I'd be deferring from a current capital, I'd have, a, I'd have a current capital gains tax rate if I recognized it today, but if I push it out, then there could be a tax code change and now my tax rate's higher on right. that. That was a big fear back in 2020. The Biden administration has proposed on multiple occasions increasing the capital gains tax rate to ordinary income rates. But I think it's important to keep in mind that that really hasn't gained very much traction in Congress from really either side of the aisle. I think at a minimum to even have the possible chance of there being an increase in the capital gains tax rate, that would require a Democrat sweep, which looks to be pretty unlikely. And even then, I think it would still be unlikely because if you remember, Democrats controlled both houses from 2020 to 2022 when this proposal came out and it still didn't go very far. I didn't think that potential increase did not gain very much support, even on the Democrats. No, I agree with all of that. And then I'd also just note that they're to accept you're getting some level of deferral. It, that higher rate basically just takes away some of the benefit of the deferral, albeit limited. And that, that dollar number isn't also the kind of expectation if there was an increase isn't so substantial relative to the long-term benefits of opportunity zones, but we'll obviously know more about the answer to that question after the elections. I guess we've sort of talked about the short-term impact of the December 31, 2026 deadline and the need for a short-term sort of extension, uh, and in one of the reasons to have that short-term extension of the investment date is to give time for the actual renewal uh, of the incentive. So if you could share with the audience what your view of a renewal of the incentive means. I said it briefly earlier, but if you could expand to build it out, that would be good for our audience to hear. Sure. So the extension that we're referring to is a two-year extension with everything else staying the same, essentially. It just gives investors an additional two years to defer gains. The opportunity zones that are designated currently stay the same. Everything else stays the same. But we push the extension back two years. The renewal that Mike's referring to, this would be a, a basically a redesignation of opportunity zones, a new eight, nine, ten-year uh, window for which investment to happen into. Um, bringing back some of the expired portion of the incentive. If you recall, uh, investments that are held for five years uh, prior to the inclusion date in 2026 were eligible for a 10% basis step up. So it's 10% of the original gain not being taxed. If it was held for seven years, it would be an additional 5% to that. So a total of 15%. All that would be back in play again. There'd be a, a deferral window that would push out probably seven years again, six, seven years to when the tax would be due for those initially deferred gains. And maybe there could be some changes in the way that's, that's designed, but that's what we're talking about when we say renewal. It's, it's a, 
another bite at the apple for the entire show. Yeah, as, you, as we've discussed quite a bit during the Opportunity Zones Working Group calls and meetings, there could be other enhancement and improvements to help better target uh, Opportunity Zones investment and further aid in capital flow uh, to distressed communities. So there's, there's more beyond a, sh a mere kind of extension, if you will, in terms of redesignation, there'd be some statutory changes to further refine uh, opportunities of space for what we've learned over the last uh, few years. So uh, Jason, before you, you get off the podcast here, I did want you to share with our audience some of the ways in which if they're interested in getting more involved in the process of extending and renewing opportunity zones, ways that they can do that, as well as ways that they can stay current on what's happening in the opportunity zones community. Absolutely. First and foremost, register and attend in Washington, DC. Mike gave out the information earlier. That's going to be a great place to find out exactly what's going on where things are now, where things are going with the OC incentive. It's going to be filled with professionals that work in this every day, can answer any questions that you might have, and it's a great place to get current. A great place to stay current is to join the Opportunity Zone Working Group that I lead with, with Noel Grady. It is a fantastic place. We, as I talked about earlier, we get together at least monthly. We've been very vocal. In, in, in providing commentary to Treasury when the uh, regulations were being developed. We're also providing recommendations for how the Opportunity Zones incentive can be improved going forward with the renewal, hopefully. So those, those are the two best, the right. two best you can get current and stay current with the Opportunity Zones incentive. Great. Thank you for that. And thank you for being a guest on this episode. And I will say to our audience, please reach out to Jason questions about Opportunity Zones investing and about the push for an extension and renewal. Uh, I will include his contact information in today's show notes. Now, before I get to the off mic section, Jason, I did want to remind the audience, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform or platforms uh, you prefer. Uh, also, please share the podcast with your colleagues. Uh, it's a great way for those uh, new to various community development incentives to get up to speed and learn what's kind of current. Uh, I'd also encourage you to leave a review of the podcast. If you give us a good review, uh, it helps others find the podcast. And I'll also note that we have a full archive of episodes, which goes back 17 years to October 2007, in case you're wondering how long we've been doing the podcast. It's not quite, but close to half 35 year history of Novograd. And that full archive of episodes is available on Novoco.com. So let's turn now to our off mic section. This is an area of the podcast, a space in the podcast where we get to give a shout out. My guest gets to give a shout out to someone working with one of the various tax incentives that Novogratic specializes in. It's a great opportunity to highlight someone who really deserves special recognition for their contribution to community development. So with that, Jason, who would you like to highlight? I would like to highlight Bob Lushens, fellow Bob's Impact Capital. For those of you that don't know Bob's group, they're really focused on the impact investing in Opportunity Zones with a particular focus on affordable and workforce housing. And they're just doing a great job. So I wanted to, I wanted to give a shout out to Bob. To give Bob's full name again? Bob Hutchins, or Robert Hutchins, with Elevaz Impact Capital. Great. Thank you for that shout out. And I echo your shout out. Thanks for all that you're doing for community development, Bob. So Jason? Thank you again for being on this week's episode. It's a pleasure to have you back on the show and hopefully you'll come back again sometime soon. Absolutely. And to our audience, I'm Mike Novogratik. Thanks for listening. This weekly podcast has been brought to you by Novogratik and Company LLP. 
Archive podcasts are available online at www.novaco.com slash podcast or by subscribing to the Tax Credit Tuesday podcast in iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Radio Public. You can find related links referenced in this podcast on our website at www.novaco.com slash podcast. Novogratic and Company LLP is a national certified public accounting and consulting firm with offices nationwide. Learn more about our professional services at www.novaco.com.